Please turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 4, beginning with verse 44. God here speaking through his servant Moses. This is the law that Moses set before the people of Israel. These are the testimonies, the statutes and rules which Moses spoke to the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt, beyond the Jordan in the valley opposite Beth Peor, in the land of Sion, king of the Amorites who lived in Heshbon, whom Moses and the people of Israel defeated when they came out of Egypt. And they took possession of his land. In the land of Og, the king of Bashan, the two kings of the Amorites who lived to the east beyond the Jordan, from Aror, which is on the edge of the valley of the Arnon, as far as Mount Sirion, that is Hermon, together with all the Arabah on the east side of the Jordan, as far as the sea of the Arabah under the slopes of Pisgah. And Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the rules that I speak in your hearing today, and you shall learn them and be careful to do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. Not with our fathers did the Lord make this covenant, but with us, who are all of us here alive today. The Lord spoke with you face to face at the mountain, out of the midst of the fire, while I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord. For you were afraid because of the fire, and you did not go up into the mountain. He said, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder and you shall not commit adultery and you shall 
not steal. And you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, or his male servant, or his female servant, his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Thus far, the reading of God's word. Let's pray. God, our Father, we pray that you would open our hearts this morning to your word. That we would be sensitive to the leading of your spirit. We pray that you would work your grace in us, for you know we need it. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It suddenly occurred to me that I failed to read our New Testament reading from 1 Timothy. So if you will quickly turn with me to 1 Timothy. We read in verse 8 of chapter 1. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Thus far, our New Testament reading. I'm going to ask a question to all children this morning of whatever age, and I hope you'll be honest. How many of you like Legos? My namesake grandson, Lee the Third, also known as Buddy, had his eighth birthday recently, and because of his love both for the Lego building blocks as well as his love of the excitement of Star Wars wanted a big Star Wars Lego ship. And so Nancy and I decided to get him this big Lego Star Wars ship. His parents were actually taking a brief vacation on the day of his birthday, so that night when he opened it, they were in their residence where they were staying, but they told him that he could not open it and start on it till the next morning. What they didn't know is that at two in the morning, he woke up, he went downstairs, turned the light on, opened his Lego box, and started building it. Now this was, this had hundreds and hundreds of pieces, and the pieces were grouped in different bags. There were probably 10 or 15, maybe close to 20 different bags, and, and the instruction book was about the size of a small catalog, and, and he just quietly turned a page at a time so that when his parents got up in the morning, he had a 
a portion of it finished. And they were astonished. And he just, he stopped for breakfast, but immediately went back. And for the better part of two days, he built this beautiful Lego uh, spaceship. I don't even know what kind it was, but it had lots of pieces and lots of detail. He did it all by himself. And he had it exactly right. No pieces left over. None in the wrong spots. Now how was he able to do that? It took him two days almost to build it. And then he played for it the rest of the week whenever he could when the parents weren't out doing vacation-y things. But, but how could he do that? He did it because there was this instruction book. And the instruction book told him which bag to start with and open, and what to do with those pieces in sequence, one at a time, how to fit them together, and then when to open the next bag, and how to add those pieces onto the other pieces, but sometimes you didn't, and sometimes you fit those pieces together before you put them together, and it went on and on and on. And when he was done, he had this beautiful spaceship that he just played with as much as he could. Now this morning, we are engaged in a study of the book of Deuteronomy, which frankly many Christians avoid because the name itself, second law, frightens them. They think it's a bunch of laws, and who wants to just read through a bunch of laws? that don't even always seem to relate to us in our current culture and circumstance. But in actuality, as we've begun our study, and hopefully you've already noticed, Deuteronomy is not just a set of laws. In fact, Deuteronomy is primarily three sermons that Moses preached to the people of God about many laws, but not exclusively about laws, just before they were going to enter into the promised land. Now the first sermon, found in chapters 1 to 4, reminded the people, how did we get to this point? How are we standing here on the east side of the promised land, right next to the Jordan River, waiting to enter into the land of promise that God had promised to give to us? as his people. Our text this morning introduces us to the second sermon. Indeed, it's the longest sermon. It, it runs from chapter 5 all the way to chapter 26. It gives instructions how the people are to enter the land of promise. They've already figured out how they got to where they were, reviewed that material now. How are they to go in? How are they to live before God as his people? Notice in um, the introduction to this sermon in verse 44, where it says in Verse 44, this is the law that Moses set before the people of Israel. Now, this law is the Hebrew word Torah, and as we have previously examined this word, it is a word that it can rightly be translated law, but which has a much broader range of meaning so that the emphasis is not so much on penal codes, but on instruction. Instruction. 
We usually think of penal codes when we hear the word law and thus our displeasure of reading books like Deuteronomy that we think are filled with laws like penal codes. But it, it at its heart means instruction. Now the interesting thing here is that as he now is introducing the second sermon, he really goes back to the very beginning of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 1 to 5, and basically repeats it in similar language about this. Only there he said, these are the words. These are the words that Moses spoke, but it identifies where they are. And in verse 5 of chapter 1, beyond the Jordan in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to explain this law, this instruction. So he goes back to where he started as if he's picking up on that same idea. He wants to explain the instructions that God has given to his people. He took that introductory uh, side trip of reminding them how we got to the place we're at, but now he's getting down to actually explaining this law and address the heart of his concern. How were they going to live in this promised land that God had given to them as the people of God? And for this, he for this instruction, he was giving them such things as statutes and rules. That's what we read in verse 45. These are the testimonies, the statutes and the rules which Moses spoke to the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt beyond the Jordan where they were located. Now what's interesting is that these statutes and rules make us think more of the penal code kind of laws rather than merely instruction. But these two words together, statutes and rules, tend to be a summary of what God wants for his people so that we see in the long sermon from chapter 5 to chapter 26, it's actually broken up into two sections from chapter 5 through chapter 11 and from chapter 12 through chapter 26, where chapter 5 focuses on a more broad view of God's instructions for his people, and chapters 12 through 26 gets into specifics of how he wants them to act on their day-to-day -day living. Now, the reason we know that is that these passages are framed by these words, statutes and rules. So, for example, Deuteronomy 5, verse 1, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the rules that I speak in your hearing today. And then in chapter 11, Verse 32, it ends, You shall be careful to do all the statutes and rules that I am setting before you today. So it's framing what's between those sections, and that turns out to be a broader view of God's instruction. Then immediately in verse tw uh, chapter 12, he says, these are the statutes and rules that you shall be careful to do in the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. You shall, and it goes on now to speak in more specifics of what they're to do. And then at the end, or near the end of Deuteronomy 26 in verse 16, in summing it up, he says, This day the Lord your God commands you to do these statutes and rules. You shall therefore be careful to do them with all your heart and with all your soul. You've declared today that the Lord is your God and that you will walk in his ways and so on. So again, you have this framing now of the two major parts of his sermon. 
broad instructions, more detailed rules. All of it can be embraced under the idea of Torah or instructions. Indeed, all can be subsumed under the heading statutes and rules, or as some other translations say, um, decrees and regulations. Now today, we want to focus on this idea that God has given instruction to his people. God has given instruction to his people. When you say God has given laws to his people, we tend to bristle a little bit. Laws to us seem to be restrictive. They get in our way. They don't let us do maybe what we really want to do. But you see, if we think of law not just as limiting, but law as instruction, it makes it a little bit different. It makes it a little bit different. You see, because it's when you follow the instructions that you can enjoy what it is you're putting together. If you don't have instructions, you may not know what to do with whatever it is you've been given. You may not have any idea what it is. You can't enjoy what you've been given. But God has given instructions to his people. He's, that's, this is the law Moses set before the people of Israel. These are the testimonies, the statutes, and the rules which Moses spoke to the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt, beyond the Jordan, in the valley opposite Beth Peor in the land of Sion, king of the Amorites, etc. And the first thing we see about God's instructions for God's people is that they are rooted in grace. That they're rooted in grace. You see, as he says, these are the testimony, statutes, and rules that Moses spoke. He spoke to them where they were in the valley before the Jordan, where they had been brought by God after he took them out of Egypt and had enabled them to defeat Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan. Not because they were military geniuses, but because God's power went before them. That's how they got there, by God's mercy and God's grace. Furthermore, as he begins in chapter 5 and describes them coming to Mount Sinai at Horeb and God speaking to the people, the very first words out of the mouth of God with regard to that passage that we call the Ten Commandments are not imperatives. They are not commandments. They, in fact, are indicatives, merely statements of fact. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery before God ever speaks the command to his people, he speaks of his grace. I am the Lord. I am your God. I brought you out of slavery, out of the land of Egypt. And it wasn't because they were worthy. It was because God was gracious. You know, we talk about the Ten Commandments. 
and people know immediately what you're talking about. Hopefully, maybe half of you, maybe more than half, could tell me right now what the Ten Commandments were, though I'm not going to call on anyone to stand up and recite them. Hopefully, if we did it as a group project, we could boom, 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 run right through them. But do you know something? We speak of the Ten Commandments. The Bible never calls them Ten Commandments. It always refers to the Ten Words. Words of instruction. Yes, they are imperative. We can call them commandments, and God in other verses around them refers to his commandments, but as a collection, they're not called the Ten Commandments. They're called the Ten Words. I think it's just another indication that the root of God's instruction to us is his grace, not our ability to perform certain commandments, but God's instruction for God's people is rooted in grace. In John 1.17, it says, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. That grace is seen in Jesus. It's not because of what we had done. God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. That whoever obeys his commandments will have eternal life. No, it says that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. It's all about grace. That's what the New Testament is all about, and all the epistles are trying to explain it's not about works, it's about grace. But you see, the roots of that are in the Old Testament, in the instruction that God has for his people. I brought you here out of the house of slavery, out of the land of Egypt. I gave you victory over these kings. I assembled you. You wandered 40 years in the wilderness, he had said in the previous chapters, reminding them of that long journey. They were tired. They were hungry. They were tired of eating manna. They were tired of eating quail. They gagged on it. They were no condition to fight armies, but they won. God's instructions for his people are rooted in grace. And so when we think about God, we, we need to realize that what, what God is communicating to us, whatever he's asking of us, is rooted in his grace, which came to pass most clearly in sending his own son to bear the penalty for our failures to live up to his law. But grace is there right throughout all of it. Now, the second thing that is being made clear for us as a prelude to looking at the instruction, the law, is that God's instructions for God's people are established by covenant. He says here in chapter 5, verse 1, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the rules that I speak in your hearing today, and you shall learn them and be careful to do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord made a covenant. A covenant is a commitment that God made. And God's instruction is established by means of covenant. He makes a commitment to us before we made any commitment to him. Now, he calls us to respond to his commitment, but in the making of the covenant, God took the initiative. He was the one who was at Horeb. He gathered the people out of Egypt. 
And here Moses, in a sense, is regathering them. Hear, O Israel, the statutes and rules that I'm speaking in your presence today. You shall learn them and be careful to do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. A covenant. God made a commitment. And what was that covenant? It was a covenant of grace. It was a commitment that even though we were dead in our trespasses and sins and could do nothing to make ourselves acceptable to him, that he himself would send his only son to be our redeemer, to be our rescuer. That was God's commitment. And throughout the Old Testament, there's a struggle that God has made his promise, God has made his covenants, and Israel keeps on breaking all the covenants, turning their back. There was the covenant with Noah, then the covenant with Abraham, and then the covenant with Moses, and then there was the covenant with David. And then finally the prophet says, God's going to have to make a new covenant He's going to have to write it on your hearts because written in stone isn't doing you any good because you keep on failing time and again. But God has made a commitment to his people. He has gathered them as his people and God has made covenant with them. And Jesus is the fulfillment of that covenant. When God made the covenant with Abraham and the smoking fire pot passed between the pieces, indicating that if the covenant was broken, that he would have to be destroyed. Jesus was God in the flesh who was destroyed at the cross, keeping the covenant. It was God's commitment. So God's instruction for us is rooted in grace, but it's established by God's own word, by his covenant commitment to us that he's not going to break. But further, as Moses is making clear here, the covenant, the instruction that God gives his people is personal in orientation. Notice he goes on to say, not with our fathers did the Lord make this covenant, but with us who are all of us here alive today. The Lord spoke with you face to face at the mountain, out of the midst of the fire. While I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord, for you were afraid because of the fire and you did not go up into the mountain. Now, this seems a little strange. He says, not with our fathers did the Lord make this covenant. That's literally what it says. It can have the idea that not with our fathers alone did the Lord make the covenant. But it probably doesn't say that even though it is implied there because he wants the emphasis that God's covenant is with us. And the people standing there before the Jordan River, most, many of them had not heard the Lord at Mount Sinai. Most of those who heard died in the wilderness because of their unbelief and unwillingness to go into the promised land and accept the good things God had prepared for them. They said they knew better than God. So they died. And yet there's a sense in which God is saying, you heard, you were there, you are entering into that same covenant. You are hearing the same instructions. God is speaking his instruction to you who are here today. God did not sell, send a telegram announcing layoffs. He did not send 
an impersonal directive. Get your ship in order or else. God himself spoke to the people. Indeed, the, what we call the Ten Commandments, which constituted the heart of that covenant, were words that people actually heard spoken from the mouth of God. Otherwise, Moses was given to protect and shield them because God saw their infirmity that they couldn't stand hearing his word. He allowed Moses to be an intercessor. But it was personal. God cared about his people. He was sensitive to their fears. He allowed the mediator. And of course, the great mediator was Jesus himself who came to stand between us and God. So the instructions that God gave, you see, are personal in orientation. It's not here, it is, take it or leave it. God is speaking personally to us. Not just to those that heard him at Mount Sinai, but Moses is saying, even to you who are here today, you see, as God's people, you are entering into that same covenant and therefore that same relationship and so, it is as though you were there yourself hearing his voice speaking to you. And what's very interesting about this coming sermon from Deuteronomy is that there is a continual intertwining of, of Moses speaking of you, plural, you all, and you, singular, you personally. And there's not really always a clear indication of what is the difference and significance in interpretation other than the fact that it's continually reminding the hearers that yes, they are part of a covenant community and yet they are personally being engaged by God in his covenant. And then in... Moses going on to repeat the Ten Commandments with just a few slight changes that take account of their new situation, having experienced the previous 38 years wandering in the wilderness, primarily with the Fourth Commandment on the Sabbath, being rooted now not in God as the sovereign who rescued them out of Egypt, uh, as the sovereign Lord, creator, but as the God who did rescue them out of Egypt and also brought them through the wilderness to where they were standing that day so that it's rooted in redemption rather than creation. The laws are virtually the same, almost verbatim. which tells us that God's instructions for God's people is consistent in its content. The way God leads and guides us is consistent. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever. God does not tell us one thing one day and something else the other day and pull the rug out from under us and set us up to fail because he suddenly changes the rules, but the rules stay the same. There will be applications, of the rules, as he will make clear in chapters 12 through 26, you have the general rules of the covenant. And isn't it amazing that the heart of God's covenant is only 10 words, as it were? We don't have to memorize a long list of detailed rules in order to interact with God. He has given us his covenant simply, consistently, and then Jesus, prays his gracious heart, makes it even simpler. You want to know what the covenant is? You know what my instructions are for you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's what it's all about. It's personal. He cares for us. It's consistent.
So you see, as we move now and we dive in, as it were, on God's instructions for us, rather than being bored or nervous or fearful that this is a bunch of laws, no, these are God's instructions for us so that we might know how to live with a holy God against whom we've been rebelling through our lives. God kept his promise. He brought them to the promised land. And then when they rejected him, he still brought them to the promised land, even though it took 38 more years of wandering to finally get to that point. And so when God gives his instructions, it's not because he is taking joy in exercising his judgment by giving us these penal codes that are just going to throw us away and lock us up forever, which they would if that's what it were. But he gives us instructions so that we might enjoy God in living with God. Think about my grandson. What if he had been handed a box with a beautiful picture of a spacecraft and every piece was just loosely in the box and no instructions? He would have been excited initially to see what he got. But all these tiny pieces and, uh, you know, there's a lot of little pieces in Lego. I mean, there's a couple big ones, but there's a lot of little ones. And trying to figure out the proper order and how to fit them together. Do you think those instructions were a burden for my grandson? They were freeing. He got up at 2 in the morning on his own without his parents knowing. And he was able to open this box and start enjoying it. He was putting it together. He was putting it together right, just like it looked on the Picture on the front, though, it wasn't yet complete. It took him two days to get to that point. But when he got to the end of the two days, it was all put together. And so he had his spaceship. Do you think he was disappointed and feeling burdened because he had to follow that instruction book? No, that instruction book enabled him to play and have fun. God's instructions are not meant to be a burden to us. They are meant to be a guide to us so that we might find our way, as sinful as we are, into the enjoyment of fellowship with God. And so as we read through his word, as we begin a study next Sunday of each of the ten words of that central covenant, that we not see it as God oppressing us, trying to destroy us, rather see that this is God's instruction so that we can know how to meet with him and how to live with him and how to enjoy him forever. Now ultimately, God sent his own son to be a living word. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. The word became flesh and lived for a while among us. The only God who's at the Father's side, that is the word, he made him known. It's in Jesus that it all comes together and we begin to see how all the pieces fit. And we learn what God is really like because he is the image of the invisible God. He is, as it were, the only instruction book we have to truly enable us to see what God is like. But until he came, God gave his instructions in the Old Testament to guide and prepare his people. Instructions that didn't change in the New Testament. Oh, we don't need those anymore. No. That's what we saw in 1 Timothy when Paul is saying that the law is good. The instructions are good. And as he explained the usefulness of those instructions for sinners, he basically goes through the Ten Commands 
or the ten words and saying that they are in accordance with the gospel. They're not against the gospel, but they help reveal God for who he is and help us to experience and enjoy him in his love and in his mercy. Dear friends, God has given us his instructions. His instructions are for his people. God is drawing us to himself. He pulled his people out of Egypt. He brought them to the promised land. He wanted to bless them. He wants to bless you who are his people. And so it's worth our while to go back and look at these instructions, to see them in their initial place, but then to see the implications they have even for us today. God doesn't want us to be frustrated, not knowing how to put our life together and and just becoming increasingly bitter because we just can't see the way. He gives us guidance that we might see, that we might find delight and joy in getting those pieces in order, in seeing the beauty of our God and his mercy for us in Jesus, and then truly enjoying him forever. Let's pray. Oh Lord, it's only by your grace. It's not that we can obey any group of laws and somehow satisfy your holy demands. On our own, we cannot obey because our hearts are rebellious against you, but you sent your son, the living word, and before him you gave your written word that your people might know how to follow after you. Stir our hearts today with that desire that we would want to follow after you, that we would see your law not as a burden, but as a guide, a corrective, when we often need correction, but also pointing to the way of life in Christ and in your commitment to us in him. Thank you for bringing us together that we might learn more of your wonderful instruction that you have prepared for your people, that you would be our delight and our hope and our life, even in our day, so far removed from Moses' day, but you are faithful and your word stands sure You are the same. You don't change your mind on us, but you bless us. In Jesus, it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Our hymn of commitment.